the cost of education does not include the value of your house. I have known high school counselors who put down the value of their house on their kids' college education, and it cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, so that's, that's why so it is painful. Welcome to the Jennifer J. Hammond podcast. Jennifer is a licensed realtor, educator, speaker, and best-selling author. Jennifer's goal is to help you find your yay in every day. So today, one of you know, one of the reasons that I was so excited about having you guys again, and we've talked about this before, but it, you know, I always hate when people rob the equity of their house to pay for college. And so it's one of those things where when people think about a real estate show or talking about real estate, why is it so important to um, talk about how to pay for college? And yet this is a topic that really, really needs to be discussed is, you know, what are the ways to not, you know, completely rob all the equity in your home or just, you know, again, I've seen parents put themselves in a really precarious situation because they don't understand all the different ways to pay for college. So let's start there. I mean, I think it's so interesting to hear a little bit about your story. You're a father and son team. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. <laughs> Who became really passionate about this. So I don't know, dad, do you want to talk first? Sure. I'll talk first a little bit about yeah, he it. He dragged me into it anyway. That's so. right. That's okay, right. good. That's perfect. Well, you know, it all started. Uh, in fact, next month is our, my 20th year <clears throat> is um, it all started with, with uh, working with families, because uh, we are financial planners, and every year, you know, you're, you're trying to grow your practice, and you're trying to do it by, by seminars and things like this, and, you know, everybody does social security, they do retirement planning, they do all these kinds of things that are kind of boring, and we're American, so we put everything off till the year we're going to retire, um, so what we do is, is, is we said, you know, where should we look for where people want to talk to us, and I met a guy years ago, and he was out of the Department of Education. He also got into financial planning. And he had put this whole program together talking about helping families pay for college. And obviously, being from the Department of Ed, he knew the ins and outs, right? So he got together with him, and he decided after a while that he didn't want to be involved in doing it anymore. He's retired. He owns a pizza place actually, now, actually, in Wisconsin. But um, you know, we, so we started running with this thing. And what we found was we would go to a high school and and you know, you'd start the first year, 15 families. Next thing you know, you got 300 families because it, it, it's such a financial burden on people, even though it's a flash in time, but you're going to spend, you know, the average family, they don't know it. They're going to spend close to the total amount of money they spent for raising a kid to age 18. They're going to do that in four years. Yeah. So we decided let's start focusing on an area where families want to come to us. And that's what we find. In fact, just yesterday, we got another couple of phone calls and, and next thing you knew was, uh, uh, we got another appointment tomorrow from somebody we talked to two years ago. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it's become this ongoing thing and it helps us then reach our families to do full, total planning with them. Yeah. And it turned into annual presentations at all these different schools. After a while, that's how I got pulled into it is when I was coming out of college, I actually helped them start a business that had counselors that would help students apply for school. And everywhere we went, people kept telling me I needed to join what he was doing and start working with different representatives around the country let's make try and clear. help them they were telling him to yeah. join i wasn't telling him to join not that i didn't want him but you know as a he, dad, he yeah. was actually very thrilled that other people were trying to encourage me to get into it not him trying to pull me into it True. so these people kept trying to convince me to work with other advisors to go around and do more of these presentations so we started doing presentations for the school districts out in las vegas we did several up in washington utah Oregon, uh, all around Southern California. So we've been all over the country doing these presentations. And it was something I really enjoyed because you go to these rooms of several hundred people and you tell them that college can be far more affordable than they even thought possible. And you just see everyone locked in on you wanting to figure out how this actually works, not even believing that this is even possible. And it's such an amazing feeling being able to do that kind of thing. And how we came to the book really is because every, you know, six months, nine months after this would happen, families would start calling us up saying, well, we didn't get as much financial aid as we initially thought we would. And it was because people started kept making mistakes that even in the presentation, we would spend five, 10 minutes on a specific subject saying, don't make these key errors that are very, very common, because here is what this application is asking about specifically. So it could be taking equity out of your property. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. so that, that coming back to that is 
these people kept making these same mistakes. And one of the eye openers for me is several of the moms because it's, it's, let's face it, it's usually moms who get stuck with this decision. You know, dad is like, go to your mom, you know, I'm too busy or something like that. It sounds cliche, although obviously my dad was very involved, but when it comes to the actual college application, you know, keeping the schedule, all that kind of stuff, moms usually get stuck with that. And so these moms would come in with, you know, the college guidebook for dummies or the, the fist college, but I, I'm not kidding. It's kind of, it's great. But, and this is not to knock those books. Those books are great resources, but they're textbooks and they have every answer to every conceivable question you can imagine. And for most people, 98% of that book is not going to apply to you. Right. So when you deal with that, the fact that so many people kept making mistakes, uh, a lot of high school counselors don't know this information about financial aid. Some do, but most don't know how it works. They don't know how the financial aid works. They don't know how, what will count and count against you. So if you ask them with a question, they're probably not going to know the answer without having to do a lot of research themselves. So that led me to one day, okay, I'm going to make my own guidebook and take all this stuff from the presentation and all these issues that families have brought up over the years that are the core issues that re relate to everybody and let's put that all in one guide. And that's really what it came down to. So when it comes back to your, your point of, okay, how do we not use the equity? Because when it comes down to college, on the financial side of things anyway, the thing that everyone forgets is that colleges don't always charge their list price. They charge you based on your ability to pay, which means they have to know how much you have in income and assets. And they ask these questions in very specific ways. And when you mess up what they're asking about, it can really cost you. And so if the first thing you should need to know is that the cost of education does not include the value of your house. It does not. Some colleges can assess it if you have a very expensive house with a lot of equity in it, usually about a million, 1.5 or more. And that information comes from a couple of colleges we've spoken to, by the way. So the first thing you got to know is that your house doesn't count. I have known high school counselors who put down the value of their house on their kid's college education and it cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, so that's, that's so why it is painful. Oh, it's terribly painful. And so that's the first thing to know. The second thing to know is and what form is that that's on? Oh, that is on the FAFSA and the CSS. So, so and, think, and I was just saying, let me interrupt for a second. Just yes. to really to, to make that, to me, that reminds me of like, all of a sudden, you know, you, if you're somebody who buys a lottery ticket, you buy a lottery ticket and it, it becomes a winning lottery ticket worth thousands of dollars, yet you left it in the drawer mm -hmm. and you never went in to check on it. It's that same kind of like in the gut, like I just left thousands of dollars on the table. Oh, oh yeah. People make that mistake every single year. And th again, that's part of the reason why we wrote the guide. Yeah, well, one of the things is, is it all starts when families in October 1st of every year in the senior year, they're filling out this form called the FAFSA, Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And in that, it lists out all these items that, that, are, that account and don't count. And one of them is the equity of your property. Now, that's not including income property. Okay, that's handled a little bit differently. We could talk about that too. But the equity in your home. So if that money doesn't count, when you, we talked about earlier about people pulling equity out of their property, if I now pull that equity out of my property, let's say I, I think I'm going to spend $150,000 in education in the next four years. I pull that $150,000 out and I stick it in the bank account or an investment account. It now becomes visible and counts against financial aid. So why would I take money out of something that doesn't count against free, getting free financial aid and put it into something that does? You have three avenues of free financial aid. One, is, is all determined by your, your income and assets, okay? And, and so the second one then becomes uh, any kind of grants and scholarships you get based on merit. So one's need-based financially and merit-based. The third, unique ability. And we're very familiar with that. The football player, the basketball player, actually you wanna really play hockey, okay? <laughs> Hockey's kind of the higher ones. And also if you play an instrument, go take up the oboe. You know, major universities, very few oboe players, and they really like those people. And they'll give you some pretty good scholarships. Oh, so <laughs> that's free money. Those are the three money. Need-based. Well, oboe and bassoon. Oboe. And bassoon. Don't yeah, forget yeah. bassoon. Yeah. Those Don't forget, what is it? 
Uh, the oboe and bassoon are two okay. instruments that are underutilized in bands, and they always need them. It's they always need them. Yep, they'll pay you money. <laughs> they'll pay on, you yeah. money if you learn to play it. Which <laughs> that's, that's right. the other thing is, is knowing that that might actually spark an interest that could actually last somebody a lifetime. You know, yeah. I never thought about playing this particular unusual instrument that nobody talks about. <laughs> so, kind of an interesting part about that. Um, the triangle you, doesn't count, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't count. No. If so, Excuse if you me would be so upset. Oh, yeah. Well, let's say you have someone who's a saxophone player. The saxophone and the oboe have the exact same fingerings. So if you already know how to play one, it's very easy to play the other. Very good to know. He so, plays the sax. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I was a musician, so I, I kind of know some inside baseball about some of these. For anyone actually considering bassoon, it could be a nightmare. There's 26 buttons for your thumbs. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so... That one can be a bit of a challenge. But it depends on how badly you want someone to pay for college, too. I mean, yeah. you know, the choice of and not to go to a sad place, because I always want to find the silver lining. But the reason that you're so popular and the reason we're having this conversation is because there's a huge need. And to think that there's a possibility that you could never have the opportunity that you want. If if, if college is the way you want to go and you really want to go, I've talked to so many people who ended up not going because they didn't have scholarships. And, and honestly, there's no possible way I would have ever gone to college, even as, as you guys know, through my master's, if it weren't for scholarships. And I, yeah. I very much tripped over it. I didn't have parents who helped at all, <laughs> but it was just because I kept researching and researching and asking questions and asking questions. And I think um, sometimes you don't know what the right question is. So I love, yeah. and you know, since we're also on audio as well with the podcast and for Clubhouse and such, go ahead and um, t tell quickly about your book, the name of your book, where people can find it, that kind of stuff. Sure. Uh, my book is College Bound Strategies. It's the practical guide for choosing and paying for a college education or higher education. Uh, it can be found on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, pretty much any place books are sold. You can go directly to the, pu the publisher, which is lulu.com. Um, we also have a website, collegeboundstrategies.com. On there, you can find a, a lot of different links from place uh, descriptions of the book, places to buy it. There is also a GoFundMe on the website because one of the things we do with this book, and this is something we could talk about in a little bit, is uh, we raise money to be able to donate these guides to disadvantaged students. Yay. So there are a lot of students that need to know that this information because for disadvantaged students, college is pretty much free. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of high schools that don't allow us to do free talks on this top subject. So we try and raise money to be able to buy these guides and donate them directly. So the GoFundMe is also linked in that, uh, in that website. We also have a Facebook college bound strategy, uh, facebook.com forward slash college bound strategies. And up there, we have been posting all of the, Appearances you've made on different radio shows, TV, podcasts. Um, and yeah, it's, it's actually been growing quite a bit. I checked the status on Amazon of the book this past month, and it has shot up several thousand positions within the uh, education, college planning, and financial aid uh, categories on Amazon. So it's now in the top 1,000 in all those categories. That's probably because of you too. <laughs> Your show has probably helped us a lot. Oh yeah, so. quite a bit. <laughs> It Appreciate is a pleasure. Jennifer. And it's one of the reasons, and, I, and now I'm going to go back to the sad part again, is I want to talk about the mistakes. You know, you guys are so good at, at doing this. And part of the reason that, that I, and I always, as you know, I'm known for yay. And I, I want to find the yay at the end of this, but yep. let's dig a little bit into why, um, cause you touched on a little bit, but I really want to bring this home. Why is it um, we're going to talk about mistakes. So I want to talk about all the different mistakes, but let's start with the home equity mistake. You know, so often, again, this is something that uh, people have heard about over and over again. You know, I have equity in my home, so I'll pay for, I'll pull out the equity and that's how I'm going to pay for my kid's college. So let's talk about all the different reasons that this is not the way to go about it. And, and it's not just that the form and, and such, but again, because there are other avenues. So mm -hmm. So the first thing to talk about there is let's talk about some realistic pricing for college, first of all. So the first examples I'm going to talk about are the probably the, the higher end of schools. So these are actually the top of about 138, 139 group of schools. They operate on a system that's only need based for the most part. There's very little merit you can ever find here. And whenever we sit that people always ask, well, how can that be? These schools give scholarships all the time. Well, if you look at the tens of thousands of students that apply and the several thousand students that go, their GPAs, their SATs, their test scores, they're all very, very similar. 
So how do you distinguish merit against six, 7,000 people that all had a 4.2 to 4.4? How do you tell that apart? Because it could have been, you know, they took different classes or a few different things to, to differentiate GPA, even if they have the exact same grade. So you can't differentiate those people very easy. So from that standpoint, these schools are all need-based. Now, this can include schools like Harvard, Yale, Columbia, those kinds of schools, but it also includes a lot of other private schools that you usually don't think about. So places, uh, Boston College, Amherst College, those kinds of places, they are small private schools and they work on need-based. What can you afford to pay? Right. So just getting that out of the way. Let's say you have an income of $61,000 or less. They are not really going to charge you for tuition, room and board or anything. You will get a financial aid package if you do all the financial aid applications. And that's the important part. Number one mistake, not if, filling out the form. That's the number one mistake. Number one not, mistake. Yeah. Not doing mistake. So the first mistake everyone makes is not doing the forms. If you do all the forms and you qualify and your income is under, say, $61,000, which is the median American income, uh, poverty line, a couple, couple tens of thousands below that. When you get your financial aid award letter, you're going to see the big scary price listed out. We're $75,000 of room, board, tuition, fees, books, transport. Even fun is in that number. They include all that in that number. So there's even $7,000 worth of fluff in there. In there, you will see a list price somewhere in the ballpark of, okay, you only had 04. And the reason it's only around four is because you got to pay your own way to get to the school. You got to pay for your own books. But for the most part, everything else is going to be covered by a scholarship. So let's bring that income up to about 80, 90,000 bucks. It's going to be somewhere between four and six. They might charge you one or 2,000 bucks. Everything else you just got to pay for yourself. Get to the school, get your clothes, get your books, that kind of stuff. I recently ran about $100,000, $110,000 on some schools a couple of weeks ago. It was up around eight. Now, to put that in context, that is less than it costs to go to community college. And let me tell you why. When you have a student living at home, it costs between eight to $12,000 just for a student to live at home. Electrical prices, gas prices, the food that you pay, all of them going back and forth to school, all that kind of stuff. The cost of a student living at home is eight to $12,000 in room, housing, all that kind of stuff. If that student is to go away and you can redirect that money, then that money is being instantly redirected. So that's about the same or less than just living at home Whereas with a community college, you also have to have the living at home expense plus the college expense. So it's still cheaper than a community college. When I sent my boys to school, <clears throat> when Justin alone, he uh, just food, and this is going back, well, how long have you been at 10 years, 14 been, years now, right? Yeah. So um, that saved me $600 a month just on food at that time. So it's probably $800 a month now. And yeah. then you think utilities, uh, my older boy is a computer nerd. So when he went away, my, my literally my electric bill dropped 170 bucks. Okay, per month. So you start adding those numbers together. And because people don't think, well, I don't really think that number is real. Well, you start adding that stuff together. You know, we used to go to Costco. Now, you know, we don't have to go to Costco very often because we just don't buy the volume of food and things. They used to have a garage freezer because of all the food we went through. That was no longer needed when I went away to college. So that's redirected funds. So yeah. the, 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 the mistake that people make is number one, not filling out the form because they think I make too much money. That's a huge error. Because it depends on how many students you got going to school, how many people are in your family, are you a single family or you know single parent family or not, and then which parent should fill it out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then the other issue is not understanding what assets count against financial aid and which ones do not. We mentioned the, the big one: equity in your primary residence. Okay, that's a big one. It counts against financial aid. Any investment money that you have sitting around and and anything like CDs. Um, just their investment accounts. And, and this is one of the things as a planner that we run into all the time. We'll run to sit down with a person and they'll say, okay, I have $150,000 in my investment account. And my first question always is, what are your goals and what are you gonna do with that money? And they'll tell me, well, that money's earmarked. Most of it's earmarked for retirement. And why is it not in a retirement account? Retirement accounts do not count against financial aid. Second mistake people make. When they'd ask for mutual funds, stocks, bonds, and things like that on the form, what do people think about? Ah, my 401k, my IRA, and they stick it in that section. No, it tells you specifically retirement accounts don't count, but it's one of the second most common mistake. We had a family a few years ago. You know, in fact, it was, it was USC and the person got in legitimately. They weren't mm -hmm. in crew or anything. <laughs> uh, so, but they, the, kid, the guy got in 
and his dad had retired and on the on the uh, IRS forms it's and you, know, you list down what assets are there and they moved over to an IRA well it doesn't count but the school saw the asset and thought it did count so he counseled with the school sent them the IRS ruling and everything else and next thing you know this family got $25,000 a year which is what was targeted to begin with okay yeah so, so overall yeah. in that piece right there that's a over a one hundred thousand dollar mistake the school was making that this family wouldn't have been able to identify without knowing the difference in what counted and what doesn't count here's the other big one okay especially for people in your world right in real estate is they have income property yeah okay? and they have typically most people they have one or two extra houses that they're renting out or whatever and they fill out a schedule c every year mm-hmm. well schedule c does a couple of things it sets you up as a business right but it also makes all that equity in that income property count against financial aid. Right? Uh, so what they have to do is the family has to take a look at that and say, gee, is it really a business? And most of it is. So why don't I have it in a business category, like an S corp, maybe an LLC corp or something like that. That's not going to count against financial aid. Uh, right? So all of a sudden you take millions of dollars that is an equity income, equity property, and then you made it non-visible as before it is visible. We work with families who, you know, really got by on fifty, sixty thousand dollars of rental income, and right. then they end up not having to categorize, right? And they have millions of dollars, and they get no financial aid when really their cash flow is terrible, right? Yeah. And they should be qualifying, but they just don't understand that piece. That's mm-hmm. a so, huge well- one. Thank you for going through that because I think that is one that, again, with. And that's where I always talk about, you need to have an A team. I I call it your yay team because everybody on your team should actually help you say yay. And part of that is your financial planner has always been one of those that again, people often go, oh no, I can go at it myself, which again, always makes me just cringe. It's just like uh, people who want to, you know, do other taxes by just having like a software or such. And it makes me, it's the same thing in real estate. Oh, I don't need a real estate agent because I can do this all myself. And and again, if you don't have professionals, that's why I call it your yay team. If you don't have them all plugging this in, because like you just said, that's also something that's really, really important on the tax side of things to understand um, how is that going to impact things and how can I do it so that I'm not, and, and that's the reason that I don't know. I was so excited about having you guys because there's so many, I want to call it shades of gray, but it's just also the way you position yourself. The why, why do some people pay a lot of money in taxes and why do some people not? You know, if you understand LLCs and C-Corps and if you understand how to structure things and we've had amazing attorneys come on and talk about structuring things. But again, so often people get confused, they get overwhelmed and then they just don't get into action to do something about it. And then they're caught with, again, filling out a form that could literally, like, that's why I say it's like the lottery ticket, that's a winning lottery ticket, but it's sitting in your drawer because you've never actually gone to check to see how it's going to impact you and if it's a winning ticket or not. And that's the way I think that filling out this form and not understanding these particular nuances, it it can just, it's such a big deal. So I just, I had to stop you for a second there to talk about Yep. Again, you need to keep asking the questions and find out because again, it's, it, you know, it's like cha- uh, changing the direction of a ship. If you're going to change how you're reporting or any of that stuff, sometimes it might take you a minute. And part of it is a minute. You need to understand it so that you can get into action. So often people, they don't understand. And so And I think that's like something you said earlier about doing those presentations. You're doing all those presentations and then people didn't go into action. And it's one of the reasons the book is so powerful. And then again, you know, doing these episodes so that again, you can go into action. So first you have to understand it and then you you need to go, okay, so what are the steps? What's the, what do I do first? What do I do second? And then what do I do third? Mm -hmm. So thank you for that part. Yeah. Do we get a yay? (laughs) <laughs> yes, and I was saying, as you know, we're going to end. I'm going to even have John Lee come off his mic and, and talk with us, as I, I always look for the silver lining. So I want us all to uh, lift your voices and say yay, okay? So three, two, one. Yay! yay! <laughs> for the rest of the conversation, tune in for part two of this interview. Hi, I'm Jack Canfield. You may know me as the co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. And if you want more help in getting from where you are to where you want to be, I want to encourage you to listen to The Jennifer Hammond Show 